The Olympics are coming up later this summer, and as such, there's a lot of Olympic-oriented chemistry in this edition of Education and Chemistry and the Mole. We've already covered the bronze, silver, and gold coin demo back in September 2010, so this month I thought I'd have a look at gold itself. Gold is the most malleable and ductile of all metals, which means that it can be hammered to a few hundred atoms thick, and we don't have to worry about wasting too much of it when we do some demonstrations in school. I picked up this sample of gold from an art store, and I'm going to dissolve it. The most famous thing to dissolve gold in is aqua regia, a concentrated mixture of hydrochloric and nitric acids. But that implies that the only thing that you can dissolve gold in is water, when mercury will do the job just fine. Where can we find some, though? Well, for years I didn't think we had any in our own school chemistry department, and I was right. But when I looked around, we did actually find a small sample uh, for use by the physics department. So it's worth having a look in the physics cupboards before you think that you don't have any in your own school. Place a microscope slide in a plastic or wooden tray to capture any spills. Prop up one end on a piece of plasticine and place a piece of gold leaf on it. This stuff came as transfer so I didn't have to worry about handling the gold leaf itself, which can be pretty fiddly. Remove any rings, pop on some gloves and you're ready to show what happens when mercury meets gold. Take care when handling the mercury, it just loves to drip out of a pipette. I try to leave a little bit of air behind it. A flexicam might help larger classes to see what's going on, especially as you're only using a drop here. And of course, before you start, get the students to think about what they might expect to happen. Think about the forces involved. What actually happens is just beautiful. I did have a go at distilling the mixture in a small retort to get the gold back in an efficient fume cupboard. The small quantities involved meant that the mercury disappeared pretty quickly and the gold that was left behind, no longer spread out to a few atoms thick, was barely visible. When you're done, any waste can be collected along with other mercury waste you might have from, for instance, broken thermometers for eventual collection by a registered waste contractor. Any small spills can be mopped up with a one-to-one -one mixture of calcium hydroxide and flowers of sulphur and water. So when would you be likely to show this? Well, I'd normally bring this out when teaching about structure and bonding. It's a great way to show that like dissolves like. A couple of obvious questions come up. Firstly, why is gold gold at all? After all, most metals don't absorb much in the visible region. And why is mercury a liquid? To explain both these ideas, we're going to need to do a little bit of revision of first year MO theory and throw in a dash of relativity. As it turns out, the speed of an electron increases with atomic number. The outer shell electrons for mercury and gold are both in 6s orbitals, and by the time we get to these elements, the electrons are travelling so fast, 60% the speed of light, that relativity comes into play, and they experience a 25% relativistic increase in mass, and a corresponding reduction in Bohr radius. This lowers the gap between the 5d and the incomplete 6s orbitals, and where otherwise the jump would have required the absorption of a UV photon, we can now promote an electron using blue light, reflecting the familiar gold colour back to us. As to why the bonding in mercury is so much weaker than that in gold, it's useful for us to have a look at their interactions in the gas phase. This is the point at which you may wish to back away from the oncoming misconception precipice because the last thing you want your A-level students to do is to draw a dot cross diagram of diatomic gold in an A-level paper when challenged to describe metallic bonding. Diatomic gold will form in the gas phase and actually has a pretty strong bond, comparable in strength to that of chlorine, and is helped to some degree by the relativistic contraction of the bond by about 16%. Meanwhile, Diatomic mercury just doesn't seem to exist. First of all, we can explain why dihydrogen exists but not dihelium. When two hydrogen atoms approach, there's a constructive and a destructive combination of interference of 1s electrons, just like when two water waves meet and add up or cancel each other out. This leads to a bonding and a higher energy antibonding orbital. Each orbital can take up to two electrons. When two hydrogen atoms meet, each contributes one electron into the bonding orbital and we get a molecule, but when helium atoms meet, the extra two electrons go into the antibonding orbital, 
The result is that there is no overall bond between the two helium atoms. Gold and mercury share some of these features. Gold has one electron in the 6s and can form a decent diatomic bond, but mercury has two, meaning that you'll fill the antibonding orbital. As such, you could almost think of mercury as behaving in some ways like helium. This explains the weak mercury-mercury forces and its poor conductivity. The electrons are largely localized, and the interactions share some common features with van der Waals forces. This isn't a perfect explanation. You can't always use the same arguments to describe what's going on in the condensed phase as you can in the gas phase, but it's a good enough explanation, and it can be used to explain this. This is imitation gold leaf I bought by mistake. It doesn't amalgamate well with mercury at all. Whilst the mercury-mercury bonds are weak, the two 4s electrons offered by the zinc in this alloy are no better. Gold, on the other hand, offers one electron, so it can still form an appreciable bond, as does sodium, which of course has been used to extract it from brine in the caster-kellner process.